Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Oliver Blockman, Senior Conference Producer at Global Invest Group. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this live web conference on the Securities Financing Transactions Regulation. Uh, on behalf of myself and the team, I'm pleased to see so many of you have joined us here today. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Univista and Sherman and Sterling, for their continued support. Uh, in today's one hour conference, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Kay Swinburne provide a 10 minute presentation, followed by a five minute Q&A. Uh, then we will have a panel discussion of around 40 minutes. And again, we should have some time for Q&A. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the speakers and moderators for sharing with us your time and thoughts and some of the topics we'll be discussing today. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be hosted on globalinvestorgroup.com. Um, we already received a few questions for our panelists. If you wish to ask a question, you can do so by clicking the Q&A button. Uh, do keep sending through the questions for the panel and we'll try to answer as many as we can by the end of the day. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kay Swinburne, a Vice Chair of Financial Services, KPMG UK. Good morning, everybody. So it seems quite surreal to be talking to you today on the implementation of SFTR and a piece of EU FS legislation that was born out of another crisis, namely the financial crash of 2007-2008. And the period uh, after that, between 2009 and 14, marked a five-year period which changed the face of EU financial markets legislation and resulted in some 80 pieces of FS regulation and directives being passed by the co-legislators in Europe. And it included the establishment of the European supervisory authorities themselves and the European Systemic Risk Board. They're all very young. So the similarities today to that last crisis are in some ways helpful as we see in this current legislation appearing overnight almost and financial measures being taken daily and so it's useful to put the rationale for needing SFTR into context. And I think many of you recall that the EU Commissioner responsible for FS legislation and the single market legislation as a whole during this five year period was one Michel Barnier, which, yeah, given he is now the UK EU's uh, FTA negotiator, is an interesting coincidence. But his mantra as a commissioner was that he would leave no market no product or participant in the financial markets unregulated as a result of his comprehensive legislative program and some would say he achieved his ambition and his legacy lives on more than five years after the last piece of this financial legislative alphabet soup was completed and written to eu law and we're now trying to implement the last two pieces csdr dealing with settlement failures and of course, SFTR that we're talking about today. The two files, which were always interlinked and stem from the market disruptions of the last crisis. And the conclusion by many at that crisis was that the lack of transparency in the financial markets was a significant factor in the scale and interconnectedness of the shocks felt around the world. The derivative markets, the repo markets, and in particular, the increased use and opacity in the reuse of collateral led to EMIR, the derivatives legislation globally, which is the EU's version, large parts of MIFID II. It also led to the markets abuse regulation, to the regulation on benchmarks, and of course CSDR and SFTR, which collectively cover all aspects of trading and post-trade environments and the behavior of all the participants in them too. So all of these files were worked on by different negotiating teams, often different commission teams, and with very little regard during the negotiations, especially the political trialogues, as to what overlap there was and what lack of consistency might mean for market participants, particularly with respect to data fields required. And it would, of course, have saved so much time, energy, and money for you implementing had there been a horizontal piece of legislation known as an omnibus file being completed by Lord Hill during his tenure as commissioner after Barnier. It would, of course, have streamlined the reporting requirements across all legislative files. And instead, because it was abandoned, 
they all stand alone and will inevitably become more cumbersome and difficult to implement, with SFTR alone requiring over 100 reporting fields. But SFTR was always a politicised file. Despite its technical nature, lobbying by NGOs was intense at the time. And the simplistic view being that the repo market in particular had been a transmission mechanism for global contagion during the crisis and had then exaggerated the Eurozone crisis too, due to the non-transparent nature of the trades. Rehypothecation, a term politicians I say should never ever use, but it was bandied around in Brussels as evidence emerged that between five and seven times reuse of the same collateral with no knowledge of the interconnectedness in the markets was fairly obvious and commonplace. The reuse of collateral and stock lending programmes were blamed for the high rate of settlement fails and central bankers were themselves uneasy about the impact these secondary markets were having on their monetary policy ambitions. So the current implementation of SFTR at least benefits from several years of experience of trade reporting and the use of trade repositories under EMEA. Unlike EMEA, these entities are not subject to national differences in implementation as they're supervised as EU regulated entities by ESMA itself. Both EMEA and SFTR were devised to deal with systemic risk and the need to use standardized messaging, establishing new LAIs, devising UTIs and mastering dual reporting were all new requirements at that time. But now we have the experience of EMEA, so this time around, it should be easier. There is an extra complication I think we have to throw into the mix here. Of course, the UK and the EU regulators are both going to now be supervising trade repositories for both EMEA and SFTR. And they may not, of course, in the future, concur on all requirements. And the worst case scenario might be that in the future, you end up with two competing jurisdictions both requiring reporting and oversight of these trade repositories. So SFTR is a practical challenge, which requires granular daily reporting for repos and other types of S SFTs, with over, as I say, 100 reporting fields, requiring data from both sides of the trade to match, with little or very limited tolerance for errors, deliberately. So to add to this, Firms need to report all modifications, any early terminations and corrections throughout the day and throughout, of course, the trading cycle of that instrument. You start to appreciate the operational challenges ahead when you start to list all of these out. Reporting the market value of collateral and any collateral reuse and associated margins also needs to be a daily occurrence. And this legislative objective to achieve greater transparency is going to be a huge data matching exercise and the operational channel challenges I don't think can be underestimated. I'm sure the panel is going to go through the points of difficulty in the next session, but I also know that the industry is innovative and I know that there are many people out there using this regulatory change as an opportunity to further automate their trade processes and many providers are out there seeking to assist the less able or smaller entities in providing end-to-end -end solutions. Some areas that my own colleagues at KPMG are currently advising on and are finding firms with difficulties, how to interpret, for example, the requirement that no LEI means no trade. Clients are considering whether processes can stay manual or whether something like a UTI exchange, for example, should be utilised. And given the experiences and complications already experienced under EMEA's dual reporting, many are asking whether it's feasible for them to offer such delegated services on SFTs and repos. So capturing the relevant data, especially with respect to rehypothecation of collateral, is going to be challenging. And many of our clients are actually grappling with what a pre-matching process might involve and whether or not they can improve the overall quality of their reporting to justify those increased costs. Inevitably, at this stage, there are still lots of questions and not all the answers are apparent right now. But hopefully, your panellists are going to shed more light. I'm going to stop now and take some questions if there are any. But in the meantime, it's been worth a stroll for me down memory lane. We completed this file in the European Parliament 
in the first week of May in 2015. So five years ago this week. Oliver. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have got a question here for you. Um, do you believe that the phase one delay is sufficient or whether ESMA should take note of other regulators and push SFTR back further, say six months to a year? My understanding of this, the problem is it's five years late already. So this is five years from when the political will was to actually put this on the statute book. So every time you delay this, it of course actually the argument is the short term shouldn't be making a difference to implementation because you should have been arranging all of this over the last five years you had fair warning i'm slightly more sympathetic to the argument that when a crisis occurs when you have other pressures on businesses that we should take that into account and therefore for me provided it's not a case of deferring all of the work that needs to be done on this but maybe just deferring the go live date then that for me is an acceptable reason why this should be delayed but maybe it'd be interesting to see um, on your next panel, but if that same question was put to to ESMA as to what their thoughts on this might be. Yeah, we have got some some kind of questions that are focused on uh, on ESMA, uh, such as like in light of current testing results, would ESMA be able to provide further clarity in the scenarios where the UTI is not provided by the generating party on time? Can there be any fallback solutions past the reporting deadline? Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that. I think my only comment would be that we always realized this was a very complex universe with lots of intermediaries and lots of players and lots of less sophisticated financial participants in some instances in certain markets. And so you are relying on the system working perfectly at every level with everybody providing the right data, the right LEI and in date LEI and a, a UTI uh, generated on time. If all of those pieces don't work together, when you've got very little tolerance with daily notifications, then it becomes very problematic. I think it may take a while to bed down. And I think we may find in those first few months, things actually are a little bumpy and don't work perfectly. I'm afraid that's all we have time for with UK. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we will now be going on to our panelists. Thank you, Kay. Well, good morning, everybody. This is um, surreal, um, dressing up in a suit to, to, to go to my study and, uh, and give, a, give a webinar rather than a conference in person. Um, my name is Thomas Donegan. I'm a partner at Sherman and Sterling. Um, we have uh, a very strong panel today uh, to talk about SFTR. We've got uh, Nikolai Arnaudov, um, who's a senior policy officer from ESMA. We've got Chris Lewis from BMP Paribas, who's their SFTR program manager. We have Thomas Pikett, who's a vice president at JP Morgan covering this area. And Catherine Talks, um, who's at Univista and is a product manager. So amongst us, we have a lawyer, two people at banks who are running their SFTR programs uh, and a trade repository. So hopefully we should have a, a good um, broad range of um, views and experiences to share with you. Um, I was asked uh, just to kick this off with a bit of uh, level setting. So um, we obviously we'll, we'll be getting into some, some particular and complicated issues with SFTR, uh, but just a level set, generally EU entities will be in scope and non-EU entities will not be in scope. Uh, but for non-EU entities dealing with EU entities, some, some consent type issues will arise. Um, legal entity identifiers were touched on by Kay. Uh, everyone in these markets will need a legal entity identifier in order to report, and each transaction will have a, a unique transaction identifier, uh, which is generated for it. Non-financial counterparties and financial counterparties was, was an exciting issue under EMIR. Which one are you? The distinction also comes through to SFTR, but it's less important. It, it essentially uh, affects the, in the, the date when it comes into force, and it also has an impact on delegated reporting. There aren't so many differences depending on, on which category you're in. However, um, as with EMEA, uh, banks will need to know whether the people they are dealing with are NFCs or FCs, 
uh, since it's relevant to the phase in. And for smaller non-financial counterparties, uh, there is a requirement for, for mandatory delegated reporting. Um, timing, banks and investment firms need to report their side originally from April 2020, which was a few weeks ago, which is why we were doing this conference. Uh, but with COVID, that's been pushed back to July. Central counterparties and central securities depositories also currently July, uh, other financial counterparties, so banks, investment firms, funds uh, from October of this year, and then corporates from January of next year. Um, the phasing, so those who are in scope need to report by their own deadline. Uh, it, it's not a transaction by so, so that, that, that's my sort of uh, whistle, tops, whistle stop tour of uh, SFTR. Um, but let's get on to the, the panel discussion. Um, and to kick things off, I, I think Kay mentioned, mentioned well that, that SFTR has managed to benefit from the um, experiences of it, let's say. And our first discussion point was how does it differ from EMEA, uh, which is about derivatives reporting and derivatives clearing and margin and so on. Um, what lessons have been learnt um, and um, how are we doing it better this time? So maybe we should ask Catherine to talk about that first as uh, someone running a repository under both regimes. There are lots of differences and lots of similarities between the regulations as we've gone through. They've definitely evolved and learned from one another. So when EMEA was started out, it was much greater than just transaction reporting. It was a package of reforms. It included um, best practices, um, escalation procedures, early confirmation, um, clearing, and it was quite considerable for the derivatives market. When we went into EMEA, there wasn't one standard format either. So what we've seen is in EMEA, many firms turn to get delegated reporting. They turn to the buy side, turn to their sell side counterparts, and they ask them to do the reporting on their behalf. Well, actually, that led to a number of problems that they didn't anticipate, namely the fact that you can delegate the action of reporting, but you can't delegate your obligation of reporting. So those firms found that they didn't have the onus of transaction reporting, but they did actually have to reconcile and they found that the reports are fragmented. They trade with more than one counterparty because of best pricing. Um, and those counterparties might be reporting to numerous TRs. So actually the data is in a number of places and it makes that operational oversight quite considerable. For MIFIR, we saw the market change slightly. Um, all of the reporting was under a standard XML schema, but because of the personal data, firms didn't want to delegate. They didn't want to give away their personal information. And actually they'd learned that the reconciliation aspect is, is a considerable piece that they had to do for Amir. So we thought, saw more firms take back that reporting in-house. For SFTR, it's interesting because it's taken elements of both. So it is reporting to a trade repository. It's using that standard XML schema that was established in MIFIR. But actually firms are saying, well, we learned as we went along and we don't want a fragmentation of approach. We want to do something differently. So we're seeing more and more vendors enter into this space and firms are engaging with vendors to try and consolidate their reporting and report themselves using a vendor facility. So we have seen the market change and evolve as, as they've gone through the different regulations. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and I think, Nikolai, you were also going to talk about how the experience um, has been on SFTR more from the, from the regulator's perspective, what you've done differently and, 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 and how you see this uh, coming along. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Uh, uh, indeed, we have had a very nice uh, and uh, good opportunity to talk to everyone now that uh, with the lockdown in, uh, in most European countries, I think uh, this is a bit of fresh air for everyone. So it's very good uh, uh, initiative also to have this, uh, this web conference. Uh, indeed, what uh, uh, what was mentioned uh, before me by uh, uh, Kay Swinburne and also by Catherine Tox, it's, uh, uh, it's absolutely uh, true. Uh, EMIR was a very complex uh, piece of regulation, which included a lot of aspects, which, uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, created also those complexities in its implementation. In the case of SFTR, however, uh, we are much less complex at the, uh, in terms of the impact to the uh, uh, 
to the market. It's only about reporting. It's only about transparency. However, the levels of transparency and uh, uh, that we uh, want now, that uh, we require now, ha uh, have increased uh, a lot compared with uh, uh, what happened uh, uh, in 2012. Of course, this uh, comes as a, uh, uh, as a result of uh, uh, experience uh, uh, on uh, on both sides, uh, also differ, uh, the different and uh, evolving uh, uh, in developing requirements of uh, uh, the regulatory community. Uh, let's uh, 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 remember that SFTR indeed uh, came as a result of the financial crisis, but also SFTR uh, is uh, uh, has uh, had a significant uh, uh, push from the uh, Financial Stability Board from the FSB. And uh, the regimes in uh, the all main major jurisdictions came as a result of this uh, of this important uh, push. Clearly, uh, ju just just to finish uh, here, one of the aspects that you mentioned is that we would uh, the entities outside the EU uh, are not uh, obliged to uh, to report. Actually, uh, the branches of uh, non-EU entities which operate in the union they do uh, uh, need to report. They are subject. Uh, to the regulation. Therefore, in, uh, in that aspect, this is, for instance, one of the important uh, differences that exist. Another important difference uh, to, uh, uh, in terms of the scope of the entities covered. Then, of course, uh, it, it was already mentioned that it's uh, about financial stability, where uh, all the need about the life cycle uh, events reporting comes and uh, where those need to be uh, correctly represented so that uh, authorities, not only uh, conduct authorities, which uh, uh, have been mainly involved, for instance, when uh, previous reporting regimes such as MIFID, uh, MIFIR, uh, or EMIR were defined, but also the prudential authorities, financial stability authorities, systemic risk authorities like ESRB, ECB, central banks, can also access the data and make sense of that data. And I, I mean, I, I would also just comment from a, from a lawyer's perspective, I found that the consultation process on SFTR was, was very different from that under EMIR in the sense that um, when I was working with clients or, or with market associations on responses, uh, we, we saw those thought about very carefully and reflected in, in the final text that came out. Um, I think EMIR was very much a sort of top-down process where EU legislators were telling people what to do. Uh, an SFTR it, the, the reporting is very complicated, but there was a lot of consultation with industry and, and the feedback was taken on board, um, which I hope will, will mean that um, there are fewer teething problems uh, and fewer needs for substantial review uh, when it comes up for the, for the refit exercise in the future. But, but we shall see. I'm sure there will be some things to improve upon, but, but my impression, at least from a, from a lawyer's perspective, is that it's a much better developed um, regulation which builds builds upon the experiences of EMIR uh, and also is more collaborative in, it, in its origins, which makes for better law, um, but, but we shall see. Personal comment. <laughs> um, another comment, or another question we had or a topic on this was about delegated reporting, uh, which obviously exists under EMIR as well, and which a lot of people are thinking about uh, working their way through for SFTR. I think it would be good at this point to bring some of the bank's perspectives in, in on this. So maybe first we can hand across to Chris um, to tell us about his experience of delegated reporting as, as one of the banks that, that might offer or be forced to offer this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, uh, thanks again to, uh, to um, Dr. K uh, uh, for the great intro. Um, so delegated reporting for us is, is an interesting topic. I'm sure all the banks are facing uh, the same question. Um, we uh, have seen some experience of that through the um, the uh, EMEA process uh, and that has been uh, good and bad I guess in, in certain aspects. Uh, some of the challenges that we've had to consider when offering delegated reporting for SFTR, we know that we're going to have to do it for the NFCs. Um, so actually how hard is it for us to do that? You know we can just reverse the, the, the transaction report at generation time uh, and we can report that for uh, for our clients. Uh, it shouldn't be too too problematic. Um, we we have uh, sort of made a uh, a decision or more of a policy from our perspective, I guess, to say we shouldn't really be doing this for phase one 
um, counterparties. Um, we would hope that they'd be large enough and, and um, they'd have a, a robust enough process, I guess, on their side um, to, to do this reporting. In fact, uh, our understanding would be that they'd want to do that themselves. Um, uh, because I think the challenge is for people who are asking for delegated reporting, if they're getting it from some of the counterparties, but not all of the counterparties, and they're still left with the, uh, the challenge that Catherine alluded to, which is uh, one of reconciliation. Uh, and they would still have to generate some of the reporting potentially themselves, which is uh, which would then lead to a sort of mixed mode model, I guess, is, um, I would suggest would be more complex for them. But, uh, but we are offering it. It's something that uh, we are, um, you know, keen to ensure that uh, it is one of our offerings from our side. Um, what, where we are challenged uh, specifically would be around the collateral reuse, and that would be something that we wouldn't offer as a service, I think. Um, we're seeing that counterparties don't necessarily want to share that information with us, kind of understandably, uh, and that leads to a very um, uh, complex or tricky uh, operational challenge of receiving in the collateral reuse by different uh, by different routes, uh, and then be able to process it and then send it out again, all within a, uh, a sort of 24, 48 hour time period, which is a challenge for, them, for, um, for everybody, I guess, especially when you're doing it on a number of fronts. Um, so, so I guess that's that's our view on delegated reporting. Um, uh, again, back to the point Catherine made earlier, um, it's uh, you know back to the sort of uh, uh, racy model. We can be responsible for doing it, but obviously, uh, we we wouldn't be accountable for the actual reporting thereof. Um, so that's also another consideration. Um, and uh, we get into the the bounds of legalese. Um, I'm sure Thomas, uh, this is your area of expertise. Uh, where we'd have to put a, um, you know, put contracts around actually what we will be doing or be doing it um, with our clients, um, although we've kind of templatized that process. Uh, and in fact, um, for those who that were already doing it for EMEA, we've we've just extended that process. So, um, so I guess uh, from a BMP perspective, that's kind of our our view. And then um, Tom, Tom, do you want to speak about your experience at JP Morgan? Yeah, sure. So I think it's important to note there's kind of two different types of delegated reporting in, in SFTR as I see them. So you've got, I'm coming at this from uh, an agency lending standpoint. So given that pretty much every agent lender in this space is going to be offering a service where we are reporting on behalf of our clients, because acting as agent, we hold all the trade information, we have the collateral information and management of all of the life cycle events and management of all of the operations. It is um, different from the sort of delegated reporting that Chris was talking about. So Chris and um, talking about the Amir experience as well, typically delegated reporting was where the other side of the trade would essentially agree to flip that report and send it down to the trade repository. With um, delegated reporting from an agent lender standpoint, <clears throat> we're obviously doing the report generation for our client. We're not going to do it for the other side of the trade. We are doing the, the execution as an agent but obviously we are not seen as a counterparty. And that delegated reporting that we offer is more um, um, whole service, I guess, than, than what you would see under, under EMIR in the sense that we are managing the, all of the lifecycle events, all the operations process around that, managing the, the, the vendor relationships and the reconciliations. Um, and so actually you've got two, like I've mentioned, you've got two different flavors of delegated reporting um, under SFTR. Now, one of the key things is that for us, our clients are dependent on us um, as, as all agent lenders' clients are when, they're, when they are within scope. But then obviously our borrower counterparties are dependent on us as agent lenders to share data as well. So delegated reporting, we have, we're obviously providing a service for our, our clients, but then... <clears throat> We're not providing a reporting service for our borrowers, clearly, but we are um, integral to also sharing data with them in order to support their reporting when the uh, agent lender is an undisclosed agent lender because they need to know who the underlying client is. So I think there's, there's that nuance that needs to be um, recognised between perhaps a mere reporting or whether you're talking about perhaps on the repo side for delegated reporting. Certainly the agent lender delegated reporting is much more... Um, um, akin to kind of a whole service offering for our clients. And I think one of the 
challenges that all agent lenders have is making sure that our clients are aware, as um, Dr. K and as um, you know, we talked about on this panel, are aware of the challenges that are going to come up with the regulation on go live day. There's lots of best practice out there. There are still questions that um, are going to be asked <clears throat> and are being asked of ESMA um, and the NCAs. And so I think you know, an awareness um, to be brought to our clients um, um, across uh, Asian lenders around the sort of challenges that um, SFTR brings, um, particularly when you're offering sort of a whole service offering as Asian lenders are typically providing. Yeah, and I think it's important to mention, um, so thanks Tom for pointing that out, the, um, you know, I'm talking from the principal side for BNP within the agency lending side, and a BP2S side, we have a completely separate um, delegated reporting service. Yeah, thanks both. And, and Catherine, do you want to talk about how you've seen delegated reporting working? So you have to interact with both the institutions and with the various vendors out there. Uh, and and what, what are you seeing happening in, in, in your, from your uh, eagle eye view of the world? Yeah, I think it's quite an interesting discussion because um, the world of SF, SFTs is quite complex and you can see from looking at the different perspectives, an agent lender is very different to an investment management firm or, or a financial counterparty who would be using different models and using them in different circumstances. So actually, there's going to be quite a lot of complexity from firms who are potentially sending some of their flow through one route and some of their flow through another, depending on the internal practices that they have. One of the things that we have really noticed is that um, there was a lot of talking about delegated reporting and the types of um, data that needs to be transmitted. But as time's gone on, I think firms are looking at different models and different practices because of the complexities that delegated reporting brings. Um, obviously, with a number of agent lenders, they're looking at different types of models themselves, so either offering a delegated reporting or can they generate the reports to send back to those firms and allow the firms to still do the reporting themselves. So we are seeing different uptakes depending on the firm. Generally, if it's a larger firm that have a number of different models that they're doing internally or trading through different books and different asset classes, then they are looking to consolidate that a lot more and bring that back in house rather than relying on their counterparts to do it for them. I guess one of the complexities as well that we haven't really covered is anytime you do assisted reporting, you have a requirement under SFTR that's just coming in for a mere under refit, and that's the explicit permission. So any firm who is reporting to a repository um, and they're submitting that data on behalf of another entity and they're not part of the same legal entity structures, they do have to satisfy explicit permission requirements, which means they need the explicit consent of that reporting party to send that data on their behalf. So all of these firms will have extra obligations to make sure they can satisfy these consents in the repositories, otherwise the reports just won't be accepted. Thanks, Catherine. And, and I think, um, Nikolai, did you want to comment on this as well, or should we move on to vendors? Yeah, very shortly, only indeed, uh, uh, clearly there is a difference between the uh, allocation of responsibility in, in SFTR, which was uh, actually the pioneering uh, uh, regulation establishing obligations, for instance, for financial to report on behalf of uh, small and medium non-financials and uh, allocation of responsibilities for uh, fund managers uh, on behalf of the funds. So completely different from the delegated reporting. Indeed, what we have seen with uh, delegated reporting is that uh, whereas in the beginning was uh, a way for uh, especially not very sophisticated entities to be able to feel some confidence that they're going to be discharging their reporting obligations in a, a, a consistent and compliant manner, uh, we have seen that uh, as the time has passed and as the uh, requirements have evolved, uh, uh, we are seeing certainly more problems uh, 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 with this and uh, uh, indeed has been an area which has been uh, an important uh, under, under EMIR to, uh, to act upon and uh, to ensure that also the entities which are uh, used to report uh, uh, have uh, all the permissions, as uh, Catherine was saying, uh, to ensure, of course, confidentiality of data and uh, reduce any risk of data breach, but also to ensure that there is a, a lot on data quality. And SFTR, let's not forget, at least on uh, the implementing side, it's very much about the quality of the data. Uh, SFTR was the 
the first uh, reporting regime also in which we included a lot of standards on uh, data quality, on the verification of data, how it should be uh, uh, reported, uh, how it should be uh, uh, verified, uh, when the uh, uh, feedback should go to the, uh, uh, to the report submitting entities. The, the structure there, it's, uh, it's becoming somehow more, more sophisticated, if we, if we can put it there for, Indeed, it's, uh, it's important that uh, also the, when there is a delegation of reporting, all those standards which are required when an entity reports on its uh, on behalf are also uh, uh, duly respected. Thanks, Nikolai. And, and I, um, we'll move on now to vendors. So just to, to build on what's been said, um, obviously SFTR requires uh, banks financial counterparties to offer delegated reporting uh, to smaller corporates. Um, but that doesn't necessarily work for everybody because if you have a, a roster of different banks, then, then you would have a roster of different people provided, providing reporting. So what we've seen um, as under EMIR, but perhaps to a greater extent here is the rise of vendors who, who can cover all of your relationships. Um, and I think uh, I think Chris was going to speak first to this and, and the experiences he's had on the bank side of having to then deal with lots of people more than the, just the clients they were dealing, you were dealing with. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to talk to it. I know that Tom was interested in talking with it and actually um, maybe a sort of discussion between Tom and I on this topic might be quite interesting. Uh, I have some fairly strong views. I think, um, I think there are some great vendors out in the marketplace uh, offering some great solutions um, I am concerned that there are too many uh, and at this point it seems to be that every vendor wants to get their, um, their teeth into a, 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 a get a chunk of the SFTR apple. I mean Tom how do you feel about that? Yeah I think it depends on the area that you're looking at for <clears throat> specific so I think in terms of a, a, a product I guess from a securities lending standpoint there are fairly um, small number of vendors um, who are offering that kind of full suite of solutions. Um, and I think they have kind of stepped in um, to, to help kind of maybe less so with the focus on delegated reporting, certainly from an agent lender standpoint, and more a focus on sharing data. As, as we know, this being a dual-sided reporting um, requirement, uh, there's, a, there's a high uh, volume of data that needs to be shared between the counterparties. And again, one of the key kind of shifting um, elements of, of SFTR is that, you know, whereas before trades would be, you know, it would be a trade between a borrower and JP Morgan agent lender, and then there would be an, a, an agent lender disclosure that would follow after. We are now, um, certainly from our standpoint, we're going to be sharing um, the allocations intraday um, with our borrowers. And what that means is we need a platform to be able to do that to avoid um, having to build out individual connections with all of our borrowers. Now, in the main, we're, 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 we're kind of comfortable that our chosen um, vendors are, are, are able to cover most of our um, most of our borrower community. But I think you're right, Chris. I think if you look outside of that and you look at um, the different platforms, the different post-trade engines, the different, um, certainly trade repositories themselves also have their own kind of vendor um, 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 offerings as well, separate, sitting as separate entities. I think if you look in that kind of ecosystem, then there are a plethora of vendors that are able to help with a specific piece um, based on how, the sort of um, uh, element of the securities finance market that they are post, uh, that, that, that they're processing. So I think there's kind of two different um, areas. I think perhaps on the lending side, there's more of a you know a consolidation around the kind of key. Uh, vendors in that space um, but I think as you look outside of that certainly Chris I should imagine from where from, from your standpoint and the amount of products you're covering uh, from, at BNP that that ecosystem is much bigger so I think again agent lenders are um, um, in a position where perhaps we can leverage that fact that, that, that the vendors are um, perhaps a bit more consolidated uh, in the lending space so yeah so, I, I, that, yeah that's a good point and again you know you and I I guess are talking about two sides of, of the same coin but the um Certainly, from our perspective, we, you know, as we as we reach out to our clients and we have um, hundreds of clients uh, to reach out to, we are finding that and they each want to to use a different solution for generation of UTI or matching. Uh, uh, some want to do pre-matching, some don't. 
but obviously at some level we when we report to the trade repository we need to make sure we match um, so clearly we want to um, have that shared UTI experience uh, and and that is proving uh, an interesting challenge for us as we go through and discuss all the different potential solutions you know we, we've we have a bulk of clients on, on sort of the core two or maybe three um, platforms, which is which is great news. But then you have a long tail uh, of people who, you know, want to exchange um, UTI by you know, various uh, you know, means, whether it be instant message or whether it be email. Or you've even had one client ask for fax, which um, I didn't realise. I mean, you know, I'm probably of the generation who understands fax, but um, I'm sure that there are people out there who've never heard of it. Um, so, you know, I guess these are, these are challenges that we face and, um, uh, I really sincerely hope that the market can come together in, in, you know, 12, 18 months and start to consolidate down. And I think it will make, you know, especially from Esmond's perspective, this whole thing a lot easier. And also from the TR's perspective, you're going to get a consolidation of UTI generation points. Um, and um, uh, you'll be able to get the clarity, I think, that actually the regulation is really asking for. At the moment, you know, it's a little bit like the Wild West out there. Everybody wants a piece of the pie, and understandably. Um, and so I kind of guess, I hope from my perspective, that um, things start to consolidate down um, and we get a little bit more clarity. Very good. And then, Jeff, you just to move on to the next, the next piece of the, the chain repositories, um, again, that you know there are a number of providers. And obviously, uh, I can't endorse any of them, but we do have one representative of a, of a repository here, and I, I think it'd be interesting to hear her views on you know what 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 are the differences between the main repository. So I'm not going to go on a sales pitch here, but um, there are four key repositories. One of the interesting things about SFTR is actually the repository processing has been very defined by ESMA. And what that means is we take in the same XML, we treat it in the same way, we do the same validations, eventually we'll have a consolidated list of error codes, all the responses will be the same. All the responses have to be provided in 60 minutes. The reconciliation rules are the same. We work together as repositories. We actually have a weekly call where we discuss the reconciliation and how we make sure that we implement that in the best possible manner to make sure that every firm reporting to one of us has a good experience. Because you know, as a provider of a service, we want to make sure that that service is, is suitable for our client base and a, a down if one TR doesn't implement it um, the same process to another then all of the statistics across all the repositories will end up being different and that shows that there's a problem so we ha we do all come together and we are all processing in a very, very similar manner and because of the um, the ability to port and that's to move your trades from one repository to another actually firms really do have a very level playing field it's a very um, if you're not happy with one you can easily move to another so for us as trade repositories, it's all become about the additional services that we can offer. So, you know, what can we do with the data to give you back value? Are there analytics that we can do? Are there extra services like helping with XML generation? Do you need custom rules? Do you need reference data? And it's actually the use of all of these services that creates a package that we can offer as a repository. And I think all of the repositories are doing, are doing very similar things. So we're all looking at the best possible way that we can service the client base and make this as easy as possible because ultimately we want to make sure that firms can connect to the repository and can get their data easily and make sure that they have a good experience of reporting and can start getting value back from those reports and start gaining insights into, into their reporting, into the market and, and just moving forward with this so it stops being about a burden and about a cost and starts being about value that we can deliver back. Thanks very much, Catherine. And, and Chris, do you want to comment on how you went about selecting um, you, the repository you use? So I wasn't directly involved um, in the in the process. I, I actually started from the program um, mid last year. So the the repository from the BNP perspective had already been selected. I think that gets me nicely out of any tricky conversation with Catherine anyway. Um, but the uh, I. Looking back on the uh, the details of how they did that, it was more around you know the functionality of the uh, of, of the repository, um, 
their, their experience in, uh, you know, how timely the reporting could be done, um, what the pairing and matching process uh, or, 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 or functionality uh, was that existed in and around that repository. Um, again, the support le level offered, um, you know, whether it be, um, you know, through a delegated uh, reporting um, process or through potentially a hospital for, for trade submission. Um, and then obviously there's there's the financial and which um, and all those factors were were mapped and graphed uh, and and played up against each other um, to to come up with a final decision. Right. And, and Tom, do you want to speak to this as well from a JPM perspective? Or? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess from a general standpoint, right? Most of the uh, trade repositories, in fact, I think all of the trade repositories have a history of offering a mid or frank. You know, I think certainly be something as complicated as SFGR. I think whichever of the trade repositories is selected, you know, having that sort of background and expertise um, within uh, um, existing sort of G20 reporting is is key when making making a selection. I think you know, Univista obviously have a history in um, in providing uh, a, a derivatives reporting amongst others. Um, and so do the other kind of large trade repositories. I think it's interesting that some of the other trade repositories that were um, um, providing EMEA services have decided not to go uh, and offer services under, under SFTR. Um, so that kind of speaks to the level of complexity. And I think of the tr trade repositories, certainly that I've spoken to, um, uh, they all appear to be um, you know, more than competent based on the experience that they've had with the other, other regimes. Um, and I think, again, there is an element of, you know, Emir um, certainly had a driving factor into into the the, the, the drafting of, of SFTR, um, and so that's that appears to you know have, have helped the trade repositories. So I think that's all I, I'd add. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so some good good thoughts there about repositories. Um, just to completely change uh, topic, um, I mentioned at the start that there's been a delay for, for the first phase of, of SFTR to, to July. And given that we have Nikolai here uh, from, from ESMO, we thought it would be a good opportunity to ask him about that. Um, we've seen some Q and A's come in on this actually, some people asking whether it was necessary at all. Uh, and, and others asking whether there's going to be a further delay or, or a delay for phase two. Um, so it's clearly a, a topic people are interested in. Uh, but, but Nikolai, if you have any thoughts, please do uh, share them with us. Well, uh, I, th uh, I think this all uh, links back with uh, to what I said before. No, uh, ESMA has evolved quite a lot in the in the in the past years uh, in terms of also. Uh, the interactions with the market. There has been a lot of, uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, build up uh, of internal expertise. Uh, specifically, the uh, uh, the delay uh, was uh, something which, uh, uh, where, of course, everyone would say, uh, why would you do this one month, uh, or actually even less than one month before the uh, the go live? Everyone should be ready. Indeed, uh, the understanding was that the entities that should have been ready uh, were more or less uh, uh, in a good position potentially to start. But uh, the point was uh, was not this one. The point was that there were a lot of external uh, uh, factors which uh, can contribute to the report not going right. And uh, uh, even though uh, uh, what uh, Kim Swinburne said about, uh, of course, the regime has experienced quite some delay in terms of uh, its uh, uh, application and entry into force. Uh, it is true that uh, uh, not because of this we need to uh, to rush now to uh, to to start reporting at the point in time in which uh, the, almost all Europe is uh, uh, working from home. No? Uh, this does not mean that, of course, entity should uh, uh, be laid back and uh, not do anything. So these uh, three months are simply. Uh, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, all the entities can make the all the, and finalize all the necessary preparations, testings, uh, ensure that their business continuity works uh, uh, appropriately, so that when they start reporting from 13 July onwards, uh, the reports are of good shape, because uh, we said it before, we need the data for several purposes, and the data needs to be of good quality. That's why ESMA made uh, an important effort to standardize and harmonize as much as possible the requirements in terms of what has to be reported, how it has to be reported, how it's verified, how it's reconciled, uh, how it is provided back to the entities, 
in order to ensure that when this uh, is put into place, renders the expected results for everyone. Starting this in, uh, in April would have not been uh, uh, potentially that appropriate. Uh, and uh, this, uh, as you have seen, ESMA has also a dedicated COVID-19 uh, webpage where there have been uh, SFTR, it's uh, not the exception. It was part of the measures that ESMA took. Uh, there were, have been also other measures in terms of uh, 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 financial reporting, uh, uh, measures around uh, short selling, etc., which all have taken place uh, as a result of the unprecedented times in which uh, uh, we are living now. Uh, therefore, uh, it's also something that uh, I think it's important to, uh, to say because uh, as uh, at ESMA we have received, or we are receiving a lots of queries from entities, can I start reporting before or not? What, what does it mean? Well, the, uh, uh, the statement that we have issued, we, we understand that it is the statement that we, we can issue in terms of uh, but of course, without changing uh, level one, because let's uh, not forget uh, SFTR entry uh, date of application is in level one, but it's what we can do for, to alleviate a burden to the market and to ensure that everyone knows what are the expectations of the supervisors, what are the expectations of regulators. But then we want everyone to report correctly from 13th of July. We don't want entities to start doing tests uh, or something which is unnecessary. Testing, of course, it's a necessary thing, but uh, uh, submitting data which they think, well, this is data which they might not supervise, let me play a bit with it. No, the uh, time until 13th of July should be used to be ready to report correctly from 13th of July, to receive all the feedback and to be able to process the data accordingly. Thanks, uh, I think, I think, I think some of the other panelists have some thoughts on the timing issue as well. I mean, maybe Catherine, do you want to talk about your perspective on it as someone who would have been having to be up and running uh, three weeks ago? Yeah, so I think it's quite interesting. I think what we've seen a repository, as a repository is very in line with the market feedback. So ICMA and ISLA were very active in talking to all of the market participants that make up those, um, those industry bodies and, you know, discussing about the issues that they were having because of the COVID crisis, um, it really did impact firms. It really affected business as usual processing, which meant that, you know, they couldn't concentrate on completing what was needed to, to go live in an accurate and complete manner for SFTR. So the industry really did push and sent the letter to ESMA requesting the delay. And actually as a repository, what we noticed was, especially for the first few weeks since the UK lock-in happened, that firms, you know, they, they didn't test so much. I think they were just getting into their new business as usual practices, making sure they had the right equipment for staff to be able to work from home, that they could support the, um, the higher than usual volume of activity that, that they were processing as companies. But actually since then, we've seen firms really engaged in testing and moved dramatically forward and a lot more trades are passing the validations and I think firms really are engaged in this. It's quite, in, it's quite interesting that one of the questions that came in was about the phase two reporting timeline because the phase two reporting um, is actually CCPs and CSDs. And um, we know from working with LCH and CC and G that actually they were in anticipating going live in April early so that they could be there in line with the financial counterparts that make up the other side of all of those reports. So by moving everything back, I think they've just brought together the two phases that were very likely to go live together anyway. So I think it's I think it's been a very positive thing. And I think firms are treating are treating the extension with with um, the manner that it needed to be treated. So allowing them to, to make the changes that they need to, to business practices to be able to support their financial firms going forward and actually to be able to start testing and be ready for the reporting in July. We'll stop you on this one. I think we'll move on to the next question as we're short on time. There have been a few, I'm, I'm, we've got a lot of questions, so I'm trying to pick ones which, which seem to be general themes. Another theme that, that's comes up in a few questions is what if there's no LEI available for an issuer, maybe for a counterparty? What if you've got trouble generating a UTI? How do you report that? I mean, we see that question sometimes, particularly from non-EU entities saying, do we really need an LEI? And we say, yes, you do, because otherwise the bank might cut you off and stop providing you services. Um, but, but that doesn't necessarily answer the question question as to what if they don't do it. Those of you from a regulator as to what banks are supposed to do, cut off client, 
handling that as well. Um, I'm glad you have a view first. Yes, uh, of course, as you can imagine, as authority, we have a very, a very clear view about the use of, uh, of LEI. And um, I think actually uh, uh, speaking about difficulties in obtaining LEI in 2020 uh, uh, is not serious. Uh, 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 we have now uh, more than 1.5 million entities with LEI. Uh, there are many offerings of LEI. Uh, around 100 uh, euros or even below 100 euros uh, uh, to be uh, issued and then to be uh, to be renewed on a, uh, on a yearly basis. Therefore, the LEI per se is not the problem. It's uh, potentially the, the greater problem. It's more the awareness and the requirements, of course, in the, hot, uh, in the home jurisdictions of some of the entities which uh, transact with, uh, with us. Therefore, uh, with the European Union, uh, of course, uh, uh, LEI for counterparties, for all the entities involved in the transaction, is uh, 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 lacking of LEI. It's a no-go for ESMA and has always been a no-go for ESMA. We have been uh, uh, the main promoter of the LEI and uh, we understand that also due to the ESMA policy on uh, 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 no LEI, no trade uh, some time ago, of course, with few exceptions, uh, which uh, uh, we understand that everyone understands that these are the exceptions to the rule. Uh, this has boosted a lot the uh, use of LEI and this has also, uh, and we are aware of it, has brought benefits to the companies because once you start using the LEI, you embed it in your systems, you start making greater use of the data, you standardize internally many processes and you make most more value of the data that you have. So uh, the only area on which we have been, uh, uh, and we issued a statement uh, uh, when uh, the guidelines were published, uh, were uh, LEIs for issuers, uh, for third country issuers, where we uh, indeed have allowed for uh, uh, for one year, and we are still going to be monitoring this situation, how uh, 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 for those entities not to report uh, uh, on a temporary basis LEI if they don't have it, but we definitely inquire them to uh, obtain it as soon as possible, because uh, as, uh, as I said, LEI, speaking about issues with LEI in 2020, it's not serious. Uh, on the other codes, UTI, indeed, I think that uh, there are, and I have heard there are a lot of uh, uh, special uh, uh, special processes that have been uh, put in place in the market. There are a lot of uh, vendors and entities trying to implement solutions, which is very welcome. And I think this is uh, definitely something that uh, uh, that should happen. Uh, on, on our side, uh, the, the important part, of course, is that the, the process is following as much as as, as close as possible uh, the legal requirements and uh, the most important uh, one without forgetting the, uh, the others is that uh, uh, further to specific to following the uh, legal requirements which are clear in the uh, in the text and i think that no one has doubts about those is the timely uh, uh, communication of it so this is something which uh, for instance, we had already the waterfall approach under EMIR. Uh, we have waterfall approach under MIFIR, uh, embedded under SFTR with the necessary amendments uh, to the nature of the industry. But the other important aspect is the timeliness. And I think this is area which also we need to, uh, the industry would need to work on to ensure that the uh, uh, UTI that is generated, it's timely uh, uh, communicated, it's timely passed. This is already a requirement in the regulation. So it also has to be clear to the entity that if, uh, when supervision starts of it, if the counterparties do not put in place the necessary uh, 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 processes and, and procedures uh, uh, to ingest and to, commun to communicate and ingest the, uh, uh, the UTI, then indeed this is uh, going to be uh, uh, in a breach of the regulation. Therefore, uh, this requirement now is much more enhanced and uh, we also hope that the uh, entities would find the right way to, uh, to comply with it. Thanks very much. And, and did Chris or Tom want to talk about how they're handling these uh, challenges? Just yeah, so we'll have to be very brief. Yeah, yeah, so, so I think, okay, from, uh, from our standpoint, we are handling these challenges through the association. So I think Isla and Ikema have done a fantastic job of raising these sort of issues. On the LEI, Isla are working on um, outreach and, as Nicola mentioned, the challenge being socialising the requirements and making sure that people are aware of it, particularly when they're in a jurisdiction that doesn't enforce LEIs. So I think the associations are doing a fantastic job of consolidating that industry approach and trying to get that outreach out there. So I think that, that's certainly what we're leaning into. 
Yeah, likewise. I think the, um, the associations have been key here. Uh, the the LEI uh, makes a huge amount of sense, and obviously um, being driven from the whole method process. Um, uh, and I know it's difficult for some firms to implement because it's front to back. Uh, I, I still think it's a strategic solution to the problem. Uh, on the UTI, there are timing issues, uh, and there are always edge cases and wrinkles that need to be ironed out. I think getting some clarity around those would be helpful. Um, uh, clearly, we don't want multiple transaction reports for the same thing because you're waiting for a, a UTI to come in. That's not ideal, excuse me, <clears throat> not ideal and not what um, uh, uh, ESMA would want to see reported. Uh, just the last question, I mean, again, this is a sort of theme coming up about three or four. Um, people are asking almost kind of what's in it for us, which we can probably turn into what's in it for the future. How do we see the industry changing after SFTR? What benefits are there to the market? We, we've had a number of questions on that theme. And uh, if I can speak briefly to it, I think it's worth remembering that this wasn't necessarily done as something to help the market. Um, SFTR was first and foremost about um, dealing with problems on Lehman, for example, where there was no data on its positions and then it went into insolvency because people couldn't take the risk on, on bailing it out because they didn't know what was involved or on information for regulators about rehypothecation. But there are clearly some, some industry changes that will happen. We've talked about automation. Um, there, there's going to be some published data on, on the extent of um, repos uh, in the market. Um, so sort of open question for the panel, how do you see, you know, the market developing, the world getting better or worse as a result, as a result of this regulation? And maybe, maybe first for Catherine, because she's seeing, seeing all the data. Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely a very interesting point. I think, first of all, what we're going to see is people are working on their infrastructure. So they're working on any legacy systems that they might have anywhere that they're fudging their bookings is one thing rather than another. I think we're going to see all of that cleaned up because of the requirement to reconcile, um, which means that the data in your systems is going to be better and it's going to be more accurate. I think firms will start moving to more automated solutions. We saw in Amir that firms started doing much more T0 affirmation which meant that you knew your trade economics up front. You could disseminate that UTI very easily almost immediately after the front office booking, which then aided in all of the other processes and with CSDR over the hill that will really help reduce the number of settlement failures because you'll know all of the information that you require up front and you can disseminate that UTI through that process. One of the things that I know we're really heavily investing in is analytics so it's using that data to look at trends in your reports to look at outliers to find out where you are in the market to start using that for market abuse and just look deeper within the data that you have and start providing value back just from the reported information. I think it'll be quite interesting because I think this is the first time we're really going to see the size of the market. Um, and where the market's trading, how much is cleared, how much isn't cleared. And I think we'll find the market moving more towards a clearing model. I definitely think that it's an area that's going to be, uh, that's going to be one, of the, one of the biggest changes, I think. I think we're going to see a lot of firms um, changing their own, their own policies, their own procedures, um, and having a look at what extra value they can get out of their data um, once, it's been, once it's been provided. And uh, maybe we should do Chris, then Tom, and, uh, and then Nikolai. Yeah, I think um, I think that consistency of booking um, will be an interesting one. How can we pretty much we don't book in the same way? Um, and obviously, uh, when you transaction report, they're not going to match. We don't book them in the same way. So I think we'll see, um, a, a, you know, as Catherine termed it, a clean up. Um, I don't I don't know about the uh, moving towards clearing model. Quite possibly, um, uh, I think you know certainly platform maybe platforms will become more more prevalent as uh, UTIs get generated further upstream and get fed down I, I, I don't know the answer to that um, but the you know certainly I think there'll be a, a, a sort of a homogeneity uh, of, of data through the systems uh, and an alignment with our with our counterparts and clients yeah I think from our standpoint I think, I think you know, again, being an undisclosed agent lender, having that data shared as to who the beneficial owner is with our borrowers on an intraday basis can help our ops processes, our returns processes. So it can lead to some sort of operational efficiencies. 
Now, our borrowers are currently receiving data via the agent lender disclosure process. Again, there's talks around how SFTR could, could change that. I mean, it's important to note that all of these changes, all of these kind of positives that come out of SFTR, um, you know, occur with a, with a small number of the fields. And I think there is a, you know, there's a big difference between what the FSB um, required um, as an implementation for SFTR and the, the sort of data that they need versus, versus what we're actually uh, reporting. So I think there's still that question out there of you know, you know the the burden of the reporting versus kind of these sort of, of, of benefits that we're going to get from an operational standpoint. Obviously, we we see the the benefit um, to the regulators from a transparency standpoint, but I think um, those are probably a couple of things that we can we can um, benefit from. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. It's kind of what I was saying that it's a, it, it's a measure for other things about financial stability and information, and then you know is there a silver lining? Which I think you put very well, Tom. Yeah. And then, and then finally, I should let, let, let the last uh, the last comment for, for Nikolai from Esma how how he sees the benefits of the regime and and, and, and sees the industry evolving. Uh, absolutely, I think that uh, this is going to happen similarly to other to other regimes. Uh, we're going to be also learning with the data, uh, uh, us and uh, the market. I understand that uh, from the previous panelists that indeed. Uh, there is going to be a positive impact for the industry itself. We know it also in the, from the discussions with, uh, with some of the industry bodies that in some specific cases, specifically what we were discussing before, uh, agent lenders, etc., there is going to be a lot of uh, transparency there, which uh, uh, we expect and we understand is also going to be positive for the market. On our side, uh, uh, I had uh, um, and I have been using for quite some time a presentation in which uh, uh, we had listed all the uh, all the regulatory issues that, uh, uh, oh, sorry, all the regulatory uh, uh, benefits that we find of, uh, uh, of the data. In take the point of Tom that uh, uh, the. Uh, we are requiring uh, some more information there. Let's not forget that the information that was required by FSB uh, uh, was a very high level, then it had to be uh, included in a much more, uh, 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 let's say, detailed manner because it has to be reported in this way. You cannot report it in the way in which the FSB, for instance, uh, had, uh, had included in their uh, uh, document of 2015. And also we, uh, we made use of it uh, uh, for uh, to ensuring uh, that uh, further information on the market structure it's allowed uh, available to regulators, which, for instance, was not something which FSB was that uh, that as a macro prudential body they are not that much interested. Whereas as micro prudential, uh, we're having several micro prudential regulators in Europe uh, among us uh, ourselves, uh, ESRB, etc. It's important also to know to have knowledge on the market structure. That's why, for instance, information about agent lenders, tri-party agents, CSD participants, it's also included in the in those SFT reports. Uh, as we said, it, that it's going to have a lot of uh, benefits in terms of uh, 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 jurisdictional exposures, in terms of uh, sectorial exposures, the collateral velocity, uh, 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 the, the price discovery of uh, collateral, and uh, uh, of course, how uh, the interest rates react not that much for Estonia, but uh, for sure for the European Central Bank and the national uh, central banks, uh, how the, the repo rates change vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the uh, uh, ECB changes and so on and so forth. So we understand the data definitely is going to be very useful. Hopefully the standardization would also allow us to not have the same teething problems as in EMIR and start making use of it uh, uh, from day one. Well, thank you very much. I, th I think we'll, we'll wind it up there. I, I, I've been looking at the attendees numbers and, and thank you to everyone who's, who's stayed with us uh, almost 15 minutes after the formal end day. So I, I took that as a sign we must be saying something interesting. Um, but thank you very much to, to, to all of our, our panellists, Chris Lewis, uh, Catherine Talks, Tom Pike, to, and, and to Nikolai. And we, um, I think we will end our, our panel there. Uh, Hopefully it's been interesting. We've tried to cover most of the, the Q&As in, in broad, broad uh, outline, but we, we received rather a lot and, and, and thank you for submitting them. And, uh, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today.